Okay, for the last hand of the first episode today, um, I'm going to show you a another hand, um, and I'm doing the same thing as last time. Uh, like I said, this is just one way to get awesome value. Um, but, you know, to be honest with you, uh, it's pretty much the only thing that's different is like when you're out of position, normally people check, and in this case, I'm just leading. So here, um, I wind up, um, I get three bet, I raise another gun, I get three bet right here, you know, I call, see a flop. And then the flop comes ace, ten, two, rainbow. Uh, now, you might think, you know, a lot of people without instinctively just automatically check this flop. Like, you know, obviously you're not scared of anything. You know, you've got a set of tens. Once again, and this is something that I tell my students time and time again, this is the first criticism I have of almost all of my students, and I've coached a lot of them, is that you have to stop playing your own hand, and the first thing you're thinking about in any pot is your opponent's range of hands. That is informing every single decision you make, first and foremost, is your opponent's range of hands. After your opponent's range of hands, you then think about your own range of hands in your opponent's eyes. So what does your opponent think about your range? And then the final thing you take into consideration is where does your hand fit into your range um, in your opponent's eyes? So like right here, I know that my range is very wide. Um, in terms of my range, I know that my range is very wide and a set of tens is pretty much the very, you know, the, the very, very top of that range. But why do I go ahead and lead into him? Well, what is his range, you know? Obviously, it's, you know, a lot of hands like 8-9 suited, you know, stuff like that. It's a lot of big aces. It's a lot of big pocket pairs. Well, you know, of course if I, you know, I'm going to get money from ace-king and ace-queen no matter what. I'm, I'm obviously stacking those hands on this board. But I'm not worried about stacking ace-king and ace-queen. I'm worried about stacking the hands like pocket kings, pocket queens, or at least getting money from pocket kings, pocket queens, ace-jack, ace-nine, ace-eight. Um, you'll notice that a lot of the time, people love to check behind ace-high rainbow boards if they have some sort of mediocre ace. I am not going to let him check behind. I'm just not. Like, I have about, you know, a little over two pot size bets. I can, I know that I have enough that if I just bet big on the flop, uh, I don't have to bet very big on the turn or river to get it all in. I'm not going to let him get away from an ace at any point in the hand. And notice, I'm going to make my first bet pretty big. Uh, why do I do that? Well, no one can fold, like, anything on the first bet, like, pretty much. You know, if they have pocket kings or pocket queens against someone that's aggressive and loose, um, or just aggressive in general, I don't really play that loose, but I play aggressively. Against someone as aggressive as I am, no one, you know, almost no one will lay down kings to, to one bet. So if by making my flop bet bigger, I'm making sure that I build the pot up and, you know, make some make some money out of it. And then, by you know, by the time we get to the turn, the pot's already big, but a lot of people will actually talk themselves into calls with similar hands later on. So by leading, I'm accomplishing, number one, I'm not letting him check behind with his mediocre aces or his pocket kings or pocket queens. Um, number two, I'm inducing a lot of floats because a lot of people will float you once again on this board or bluff raise you. Similar situation, like no one likes getting let into when they three bet and it looks really weak. So I'm going to induce a lot of floats um, and I'm hoping that, you know, he'll pick up a draw and decide to bluff me all in or something like that. Um, and I'm going to stack pretty much any ace uh, that might have checked behind, and then I only get two streets of value. I'm just ensuring that I get three streets of value. And when I've done this, you know, just basically pot, it's like pot, half pot, half pot, essentially, you'll see. Um, I've been called down by some pretty goofy stuff. Like, I've been called down by pocket sevens in this situation before. Um, it's pretty remarkable, because people want to put you on, like, king, queen, or something like that. So let's go through the hand, and I'll show you a little bit about the bet sizing. So like I said, I bet 41 on the flop. Now you see the pot's 133 and he only has 150. He's got a little over a pot size bet left. Um, and notice the turn also puts is a seven of clubs. It puts down, you know, back doors in case he happened to have been floating. Um, you know, you might say also if he's floating, well, wouldn't it make sense to check to him? You know, uh, once again, it might make sense to check to him, um, but I want to make sure I stack those aces. And secondly, I think that if he's floating, if he does pick up some sort of a draw, He's going to shove it over my turn bet if I bet, you know, small enough. So I go ahead and bet half pot. It looks like I'm making it look like I, he has fold equity. Um, I'm getting him a little bit confused. And a lot of people will shove on you with this spot in this spot if they picked up a club draw or maybe not even. Like they might just shove jack queen anyway. Um, so it's really just sort of confusing them, putting them on the defensive and putting them in a very uncomfortable situation they don't want to be in. And versus, you know, 
aces, which I think comprise a pretty large percentage of his range at this point once he calls me on the flop. Um, or just in, in general, you know, he three bets me with big aces a lot. So against aces, uh, I'm basically just putting him on the good old fashioned installment plan, knowing that if he calls my half pot, it's going to be about half pot left on the river and he's going to be pretty hard pressed to fold. So in this situation, you know, it works well in this situation. It's a hand that, you know, he winds up having, um, ace jack suited, which is a hand that I might very well have stacked anyway. Um, so it's not quite as cool, but I just wanted to show it to you. Um, notice that he never even really thinks about folding ace jack. Like he called all those bets pretty quickly, despite the fact that I bet three streets into him and he raised my under the gun raise with ace jack. I mean, unless I'm completely bluffing, he's crushed because my range is like, I'm folding ace jack to his repot pre flop. So my range is like ace queen, which I also might fold pre flop or ace king or a big hand, unless I'm just completely bluffing, which doesn't really make any sense. Um, to, to three barrel in that situation. In any event, um, people don't play well, and that's why uh, we can use that against them. I'm not, you know, if I thought people played really well, then I probably wouldn't be playing uh, poker. So, you know, that's a situation, like I said, I probably would have stacked him anyway, but there's a very good chance, like with Ace Jack, that he's going to check behind that flop. A lot of people like to do that. Um, in that situation, I'm not going to, unless I have to, I have to, like, pot and then go all in um, in order to stack him, and I don't want to have to do that. So... In this situation, I don't take a chance that he even checks behind. I induce a lot of weird random bluffs. I induce a lot of call downs with very marginal hands. <clears throat> and I stack the hands that I would have stacked by checking anyway. So that's that. I hope you see how, like, you know, you know, I'm playing first against his hand range, and then I'm playing my own hand. That's going to be a concept that's going to come up time and time and time again in all of our episodes. So, um... I hope you've enjoyed this first episode. Uh, Dan and I have a ton more in store for you. Um, next week, we're going to be looking at some informational moves, like things you can, bets you can do. You know, a lot of people say the term raising for information, betting for information. Usually they use it wrong in a wrong, you know, in an incorrect fashion, and it sucks. But sometimes it's a really good play, and there are ways to do it uh, where it becomes really important. And uh, we're going to show you ways to to use those and um get really great at hand reading so that you can take people to value town and just own them the way we've had a lot of fun doing in november